one see from an app and how the event had reduced HbA1c from an average of about five uh, about 7.8 to 5.0 and we are indeed grateful for that success. In this meeting, I thought I would mention a few details regarding our current webinar, not our current webinar, but our current uh, challenge. We have finally settled on a figure of 4,667 participants, which is the number that we have passed on to MOH, of which 85% are diabetic and above the range of six, and of which 90% have a BMI of above 25 and 50% above 30. The ratio of male is to female is 70 male to 30% female. We are grateful for our audience and we hope to achieve our objective of utilizing lifestyle to support our current protocols in order to alleviate or manage diabetes. Now, that is an excellent thought. And our speaker today is Dr. Hala Hamdi, who has done her studies as an MRCP from the UAA, from uh, the UK. She is the head of department of RAC hospitals in the endocrinology department, has 30 years of clinical experience across the globe in Egypt, Kuwait, and also the UAE. She has spent her entire life in dealing with endocrinic related problems, including the pituitary, the thyroid, and the adrenal, and so on, but especially to our great benefit in the area of diabetes. She's a specialist in diabetes, and in managing the multifold comorbidities that come up with diabetes. It is with this introduction, ladies and gentlemen, that I hand over to Dr. Hala Hamdi. Dr. Hala. Sashi will be joining. Dr. Hala will be joining just now. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Hala. Good morning, ma'am. You can hear me? Yes, very clearly, Dr. Hala. Okay. Our talk today about the protocols of diabetes management. So diabetes is not only numbers of sugar, but there are other protocols which we should follow to our patients. So our, our aim is to recognize and diagnose early and manage the diabetes effectively, help to defer or delay the onset of the complications, manage the complication effectively, and have an effective referral system for optimum intervention in every level. So to diagnose diabetes, it is done by blood sugar. The fasting, 
if it is more than one to six milligram per deciliter, or doing the oral glucose tolerance test where the patient is taking 75 gram glucose and measure his sugar after two hours, where it, if it is he is diabetic, then it will be more than 200 milligram or by the HbA1c, which is more than or equal to 6.5. Any one of these will diagnose diabetes. The glycemic control is assessed by the AC1 measurement with its HbA1c, the continuous glucose monitoring or glucose management indicator and the blood glucose monitoring. So there are, there are many ways to assess whether he, our patient is well controlled or not. To assess the glycemic state, if the patient is uncontrolled or the therapy has recently changed, then every three months it should be done. If the patient is well controlled, have a stable glycemic control, that it may be every two times a year and every six months. The HP1C, this is the average of sugar in the previous three months. So if it is seven, it means that his average sugar is 154 milligram. If it is 10, then it will be 240 milligram per deciliter in the previous three months. The American Association of Diabetes said that the patient will be well controlled if his HbA1c is less than seven, but this is not the case. It is an individualized according to the patient. So if we have a young patient with a long life expectancy, no hypoglycemic risks, no established vascular complications. To protect him from these complications, then the HbA1c, our target is to be even less than 6.5. Well, if I have a patient, old age, friar, many hypoglycemic attacks, he has a severe complications. At this moment, we think that the HbA1c 7.5 or even eight will be better for this patient. But if the HbA1c is so accurate, as we said, the HbA1c is an average. So if the patient has hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, and other times he have high blood sugar, then the average will be okay. But in fact, this patient is not well controlled. So the best for patient taking insulin is to do the continuous glucose monitoring. The continuous glucose monitoring is an machine which is connected to the patient for, to, for by a subcutaneous needle, and it measures the sugar in every moment. So we can see here in this graph that there are times when the patient has hypoglycemia in the red. If he has hyperglycemia, is he well controlled? And then it gives us the glucose management indicator, which is like the average glucose, and here it is like 7.5. These patients, it's well controlled. We can avoid the hypoglycemia and it is advisable for patients, especially on insulin or pregnant ladies for tight control of their sugar. Diabetes are classified into type one diabetes where there is autoimmune beta cell destruction of the pancreas. These beta cells secrete the insulin. So there is absolute insulin deficiency, no insulin in these patients. Type two, which is due to progressive beta cell insulin secreting, frequently decreasing on the background of the insulin resistance. Specific types of diabetes like the Moody, the maturity onset diabetes, which is hereditary type, or the diseases in the pancreas like cystic fibrosis or chronic pancreatitis, or the drug induced like patients taking glucose steroids or immunosuppressants. The fourth is the gestational diabetes, which happens in the second or third trimester of pregnancy in a lady which was not clearly having diabetes before gestation. So what are our goals of care for this patient? To prevent the complication and to optimize the quality of life. This is can be taken and by what we say the SMART. SMART is specific for this patient. There are specific, not every patient taking the same medications and it should be measurable. We should 
see how our, our glycemic reaching and it should be achievable to the patient. The patient can do it also and realistic and time limited. So comprehensive medical evaluation, evaluation is needed. We have to confirm first what type of sugar he has, what type of diabetes. And this is not always easy to differentiate between type one and type two, especially in adult patients. Evaluate for these diabetic complications. Review the previous treatment and the risk factors for this patient. We have to begin engagement with the patient in the formulation of care. There may be must discussion and to take the decision and to tell the patient our target and how we can achieve it in a specific time. The ongoing management should be guided by the assessment of the overall health status, the diabetic complications, the cardiovascular risk, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, sure decision must be done between the practitioner and the patient. So the diabetic history is very important. What is, how it comes at the age, what were the symptoms of this patient? Have you have taken previous treatments or not? Have been admitted to the hospital or not? He has a family history of the first degree relative. What are the autoimmune diseases in this family? The personal history of this patient. If the patient's smoking, if he's taking alcohol, what is his habits on eating? How is blood pressure? How is the last dental visit? When the last time he do dilated examination of his eye to detect the retina? There are many, many stages which we have to assess for the patient. And then we have to refer the patient eye care for the annual dilated eye examination in the first visit. We have family planning in the ladies if they have uncontrolled sugar until the sugar is controlled. Registered dietitian also and nutrition for the medical nutrition therapy. Diabetes self-management and education and supporting of the patient. Dentists for the comprehensive dental and periodontal examination, mental health if indicated, audiology if indicated, social worker if indicated. So the most important thing is to assess the hypoglycemic risk in this patient. And there are factors that increase the hypoglycemic. We means by hypoglycemia that the blood, the sugar would be less than 70. This is very important. So we have to inquire if he is on insulin, or sulfonylurea, have any kidney or hepatic impaired function. As the longer duration of diabetes, the incidence of hypoglycemia increases. Also because when you are long having the diabetes, there is what we call the hypoglycemia unawareness, where the patient, usually if he has low blood sugar, he feels that he is sweating, having palpitations, he is tremors, but in the long term of the hypoglycemia of the diabetes, he doesn't feel the symptoms. And he discovered that his sugar is 20 or 40 and he doesn't have any symptoms. And this is very dangerous for the patient and for the brain of the patient. Also older age are more prone, the alcohol use, physical or the intellectual disability. If there is polypharmacy, some medicine may cause hypoglycemia with the use of the medicine of the sugar. History of severe hypoglycemic event. If the patient have a history of hypoglycemia, then the incidence of other hypoglycemic attacks are more. Also, we recommend immunization for the diabetic patients. Influenza is very important. Every year he should take it. As we remember in the COVID infection, when it comes to this epidemic, the diabetic patients were more prone to the respiratory sym symptoms and more in severe infections. And by immunization, they decrease these problems. So immunization for diabetic patients are important. We advise for influenza, for pneumo pneumonia, also zoster, more than 50 years, tetanus, diphtheria, petriosis, hepatitis B also is advised if less than 60 years, human papilloma for less than 26. When the patient first time know that he is diabetic, 
he has a first feeling of denial, and then he's so anxious, so depressed. So this patient should be counseled for the handle the stress more positively, replace the bad or negative thoughts with good or positive ones, and we have to control his reactions through relaxation techniques, exercising, dancing, listening to calming music, talk to someone and share the worries. And because of that, sometimes we refer them to the psychotherapy and start a hobby, learn new you know, things, Patients also needs to have physically active and we advise them for that. And we advise them when they have these exercises that they don't exercise after taking insulin immediately, advise them two hours after food. Also be aware of the hypoglycemic symptoms and to drink water before, during and after exercise. After half an hour, they should check their sugar. They have to wear comfortable and fitting shoes. People with diabetes are advised also to avoid or limit the alcohol intake. It is good to adhere to the recommended guidelines for the alcohol, which is 10 gram alcohol. Men should one to two standard drinks per day, women one standard drink per day. The alcohol drinks contain sugar and will cause the blood glucose to rise quickly. Also the extra calories in this alcohol can increase the body weight. It can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. It can interact with the diabetic medication. And because of that, we advise them to limit the use of this alcohol. And the question is how to reduce the diabetic complications. This is our fear in diabetes. I usually tell the patients, if your sugar is not controlled, after 20 years, you will know what we mean by these complications. So lifestyle modification and diabetes education is very important. The glycemic management, blood pressure management, lipid management, and we use agents would have cardiovascular and kidney benefit. So it is not only the number of the sugars. No, you have to look to the blood pressure, to the lipids, whether other complications happening or not. So what are the pharmacological approaches to glycemic treatment? For patients with type one, as we said, they need insulin and should be treated with multiple daily injection of prandial, that is we mean with food and the basal insulin, which is long acting or by continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion with the insulin pump. Most individuals with type one diabetes should use the rapid acting insulin analogs to reduce the hypoglycemia. And also they should receive education on how to match the mealtime insulin doses to the carbohydrate intake, which we call the carbohydrate counting. And also they should know when to do the physical activity and how to manage it. For adults with type two diabetes, healthy lifestyle behavior is advised self-management education, support, and avoidance of the clinical inertia. What we mean by the clinical inertia, this is also concerned by the doctors when the H1C is rising and the doctor doesn't take an active step. We should understand that the H1C sometimes rise even if we get, the patient is taking the medicine and even if he is living as we advise him, but still, Diabetes in type two is a progressive process. Sometimes it takes time, but it is going on. So we have to face it and to tackle this. In others with type two diabetes and established risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease, the treatment should include agents that reduce this cardiorenal risk. And we are lucky that we are in this era where there are now medicine which can delay or mortality and morbidity in the heart disease and the strokes. Pharmacological approaches that provide adequate efficacy to achieve and maintain the treatment goals. Weight management, of course, is an important 
which we should tackle it in type 2 diabetes. And now, according to the guidelines in 223, the American uh, Association of Diabetes, it is completely different from before. So first, we have to see if this patient have an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We mean by that, that he has a recent myocardial infarction, he has a coronary heart disease, unstable angina or stable angina. He has heart any heart condition, any previous stroke or transit ischemic stroke or a peripheral artery disease. And at this time, we should start the treatment with the agent that reduced this, which we have either the glucagon-like peptide or the uh, sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors. If the patient even have a high risk, we mean by a high risk that this patient age is more than 55, and he has two or more of these risk factors, like obesity, smoking, hypertension, high lipid, then he has to take these medicines. If the patient has heart failure, then there is also medicine which is given to him to reduce the and increase the heart ejection fraction. In chronic kidney disease, this medicine helps to either delay or dec decrease the chronic kidney and the albuminuria. Also the patients with have albuminuria, this is considered as a high risk of coronary artery disease and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We have the sodium glucose transporter two inhibitors, and also we can add or the uh, GLP. For the other patients we have no risk then we have to see if they are overweight and obese, then are medicine which reduce their weight and they help also in controlling the sugar. If the HbA1c is very high, then we have to give a strong medicine which is very high efficiency to control this HbA1c, like the dulaglutide, semiglutide, or insulin or combination oral. So according to HbA1c, we can make our plan to control the sugar. The cardiovascular disease and the risk management. Atherosclerotic cardio disease, which is coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease like strokes or transit ischemic attacks, or peripheral arterial disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality for diabetic patients. Common conditions coexist with the type 2, like hypertension and dyslipidemia. And these are clear risk factors for the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and diabetes itself. The diabetic patients itself has a double incidence of cardiovascular disease than the normal person. So if he has others like hypertension and dyslipidemia, then we are increasing the risk. Heart failure now is another major cause of mortality and morbidity from the cardiovascular disease. Patients and clinicians, as we said, should engage in a shared decision making process to determine the individual blood pressure. I face in many patients, they coming with blood pressure, 140 over 90. And we try to add some medicine to control the sugar. Say, no, it is normal. No, it is not normal in diabetics. We are trying to control everything for the heart and for the kidney. For the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association guidelines, advocate a blood pressure less than 130 over 80 in diabetic. And in chronic disease, it is less than 120 over 70. Lifestyle management is an important component of hypertension because it enhances the effectiveness of the antihypertensive medications and promotes other aspects of metabolic and vascular health and leads to few adverse effects. So also the guidelines, if the blood pressure is more than 130 over 80, or, but less than 160 over 100, then we will start with one agent. If the blood pressure initially is more than 160 over 100, then we have to start with the two agents. If the patient has a chronic artery disease or albuminuria, then we have other medicines to start with at the ACI or the ARB inhibitors. And then we should follow and add other medicines until we found our target to reach better control. 
Also, we face in our practice that many patients refuse to take the statins to control their cholesterol. They said, okay, my cholesterol is 120, this is normal. No, this is not good for diabetic patients. How to control this cholesterol? Weight loss, if indicated, reduction of the saturated fats, increase of the uh, fatty acids, viscous fiber and plant stenols, intensify the lifestyle therapy, optimize the glycemic control for patients with elevated triglycerides, more than 150, or low HDL, less than 40 in men and less than 50 in women. So triglycerides is when they are patient diabetic. We don't start the treatment for the triglycerides until the sugar is better controlled. And primary prevention in these patients who have no cardiovascular disease, nothing at all, but their age is from 40 to 75 years, we have to use the moderate intensity statin therapy in addition to the lifestyle therapy. But people with diabetes, age also 40 to 75, and at a higher cardiovascular risk. Those with one or more atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factors, as we said, if they are smoking, if they are obese, if they are hypertensive, if they are... At this moment, we have to recommend to use the high intensity statin therapy to reduce the LDL more than 50%. Our target which should be less than 70 for people with diabetes with 40 to 75 and use the statin and, the, and still it is not achieving our goal, we have to add other medicine like ezetimibe or a PCSK9 inhibitor to get our better control of the blood uh, cholesterol. People with diabetes age 20 to 39 with additional atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it may be reasonable to initiate the statin also. If more than 75 and he's already on the statin, then we have to continue on. For pregnant ladies, it is contraindicated to give statins. Secondary prevention, we mean by the secondary prevention that the people already having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, he has a previous stroke or he have a cardiovascular disease as myocardial infarction, unstable angina or angina, or has, at this moment, we have to use, in all ages, we have to use the high intensity statin therapy. And our target is to be the LDL cholesterol to be less than 55. If we are not getting this target with the tolerated dose of statin, then we have to add other medicine like imibe or the PCSK9 inhibitor. We mean by the high intensity like atorvastatin 40 to 80 or the rosuvastatin 20 to 40, while the moderate intensity is less concentration and the other varieties. Chronic kidney disease. This is one of the microvascular complications of diabetes. So at least annually, the urinary albumin and the estimated glomerular filtration rate should be assessed in people with type 1 diabetes and the duration more than five years and in all people with type 2 diabetes. In people with established diabetic kidney disease, with urinary albumin and the estimated glomerular filtration rate should be done every three uh, months, depending, of course, on the stage of the disease. We have to optimize the glucose control, optimize the blood pressure. As we said, it should be less than 120 over 70 to reduce the risk or slow the progression of the kidney. In non-pregnant people, either an AC inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is recommended. And in people with chronic kidney disease also consider, as we said, because this is considered a high risk patient, the use of the sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors or a glucose-like peptide agonist to reduce the chronic kidney disease progression and cardiovascular events. So we have to measure, as we said, the microalbuminuria and see if it is severe, more than 300 milligram, then we have to refer it to the nephrology. 
And we estimated the glomerular filtration rate. If we reach the fourth G4, severely decreased, which is less than 30, also these patients have to be referred to the uh, nephrology. So we have to optimize our guidelines according to the patient's complications. And to recommend starting the sodium glucose uh, inhibitor or the glucagon-like peptide because of their proven cardiovascular benefit. And we have discussed this with the patients. Why you are prescribing this? My sugar is controlled. Well, we prescribe this medicine to protect you. And as we see, if he has a cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes with chronic, and this is already, if he has a cardiovascular and type 2, then confirmed then we have to give him, as we said, the new medicines. Also, if he has a chronic kidney disease, we have to start with the sodium glucose transporter inhibitor. Retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy. And we mean this is a one of the microvascular complications in which the minor blood vessels in the retina is affected, causing light microaneurysms and maybe later causing retinal detachment and macular edema. And diabetic retinopathy is a highly specific vascular complication of both type one and type two. And it is strongly related to the duration of the diabetes and the level of the glycemic control. The diabetic retinopathy is the most frequent causes of new cases of blindness among adults aged 20 to 74 years in developed countries. Glaucoma, cataract, and other eye disorders also occur earlier and more frequently in diabetics. In addition to the diabetic duration, factors that increase the risk of the retinopathy include the chronic hyperglycemia, the nephropathy, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Intensive diabetic management with the goal of achieving near normal glycemia has been shown to prevent or delay the onset and the progression of the diabetic retinopathy. Adults with type 1 diabetes more than five years of the, from the onset have to have an initial dilated eye examination. All people with type 2 diabetes should have an initial dilated eye examination at the time of the diabetic diagnosis. If there is no evidence of retinopathy for one or more annual, then we can make it one to two years. Neuropathy, Dr. Asweta last week uh, speaks on neuropathy. So we'll give a hint that diabetic neuropathies are a heterogeneous group of disorders with diverse clinical manifestations. The early recognition and appropriate management in diabetics is important. Diabetic neuropathy is a diagnosis of exclusion. Yeah. Non-diabetic neuropathies may be present in people with diabetes and may be treatable. The problem with the peripheral neuropathy that it is up to 50%, it may be asymptomatic. So the physician has to search for it. As we know, if we have pain, we feel the pain or the temperature in our feet, this is a protective mechanism. If we don't feel it, then anything can injure you without you feel yeah. this. And I remember one of my patients, I saw him with burns in his feet because he went out on barefoot in a very hot weather and he has like a burns and bully coming out. He doesn't feel the temperature, the high temperature. Because of that, we have every time to examine the patient if he has lost the sensation of pain or of temperature to advise his family that before going to the bath, they should check the water because he doesn't feel if it is very hot and he can injure himself. So people with diabetes are at risk for injuries as well as diabetic foot ulcers and amputation, if not recognized. And specific treatment to reverse the underlying nerve damage is currently not available. And this is the problem. So glycemic control can effectively prevent the diabetic peripheral neuropathy and cardiac autonomic neuropathy in type one. 
and may moderately slow their progression in type 2. But it does not reverse the neuronal loss. Treatment of other modifiable risk factors like lipids, as we said, blood pressure can aid in prevention of the diabetic peripheral neuropathy progression. So it is not only the number of sugars. The cholesterol is important to control. The blood pressure also is important to control. Therapeutic strat strategies like pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic for the relief only of the painful diabetic neuropathy. It will not reverse the neuronal loss. And symptoms of autonomic neuropathy, which the patient sometimes having as resting tachycardia, or you have a sense of uh, uh, sometimes nocturnal diarrhea, can potentially reduce pain and improve the quality of the life. So what is our advice for the food care? Food ulcerations and amputations are common complications. There are factors that associated with the increased risk as the poor glycemic control, the peripheral neuropathy, peripheral arterial disease, food deformities, like charcoal joint, hammer toes, or pre ulcerative corns or callus, prior ulceration, prior amputation. If the patient have a prior amputation, he is more at risk of having again this problem. Smoking, retinopathy. Why retinopathy? Because retinopathy, this is a microvascular complication. And the neural loss also is a microvascular complication. So that means that the process is going on in his small blood vessels. Nephropathy, the same, especially the patients on dialysis or post-transplant. We have to check the pulses every time to be sure that everything is going good. And this is a big ulcer, as we see on the soul. So how to manage it? The initial treatment and the evaluation of ulceration, there are five basic principles. Offloading of the plantar ulceration, this is mandatory. He shouldn't put his leg or he has a plaster to protect him from the pressure again and opening the ulcer. Depredment of the necrotic non-viable tissue, revascularization of the ischemic wounds when necessary, management of infection, soft tissue or bone. We have to be sure that this ulcer doesn't have an osteomyelitis. That is the inflammation of the bones. Sometimes the ulcer and reach the bone, which is called osteomyelitis and use of physiologic topical dressing. So caring for patients with diabetes in conclusion is to eliminate symptoms to prevent or at least slow the development of the complications. The microvascular like the eye and the kidney disease risk reduction is accomplished through control of glycemia and blood pressure. Macrovascular, like the coronary, cerebrovascular, strokes, or peripheral vascular risk reduction through control of the lipids, the cholesterol, and the hypertension. Smoking cessation is very mandatory. Metabolic and neurologic risk reduction through the control of glycemia. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Hala. Thank you ever so much for that very enlightening and informative talk. You know, we all tend to we all tend to uh, listen to a lecture and correlate it personally to our own situation. And uh, I couldn't help but do that when you were speaking. And I have to tell you, I'm delighted with the outcome. Uh, I noticed that from your definition, I am a controlled diabetic. Uh, I come into the adult onset category and I am above the age of 75. Now, I'm delighted with the fact that when we started our challenge and I took my HbA1c uh, levels, it was in the region of 6.0. And that is very good because I started out a couple of years back at 8.5. So I am truly delighted. I notice that medication is an important and relevant part of our topic. And I must confess that I am true to my medication. And I meet my doctor from time to time 
and I am good with taking my medication timely. My weight is where I had a problem, but I'm coming close to 25 BMI, and I'm sure that will delight you, Dr. Hala, and it delights me. My blood pressure is below 130 by 80, and I am grateful to you for the affirmation that I am on the right track. However, there are many like me, Dr. Hala, who uh, would benefit greatly from, a, from your knowledge and advice. And I hand over to Dr. Wilku for the numerous questions that we would have received. Dr. Wilku, Thank sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Kennedy. Thank you, Dr. Hala, for a wonderful presentation. You have covered all aspects of the queries generally we have. So it was a nice presentation. And similarly, the questions are coming up uh, in the chat box also, and we uh, come ac uh, across uh, during the challenge. So it's similar to those questions. First question I will take as, uh, Sarfraj is asking, is there any connection between hypertension medication and diabetes? Does it increase the risk of diabetes? You have uh, mentioned in your presentation, Maybe he's having a query again. Yeah. Usually, hypertension, cholesterol, and diabetes, they are like three intersecting circles. So the patient with blood pressure, we should always check his HB1C because he is more prone, because this is like a metabolic syndrome. So it is, yes. And even any patient who is admitted with a heart attack, they usually measure the HB1C because these patients are more prone. So yes, there are a connection. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, second question comes from Har Sahaj. My mother is diabetic. Her HbA1c is 7.6. Her cholesterol is also high. She's taking medicine for last three years. On routine tests, uh, her fasting, glucose, and after food are within normal limits. But HbA1c has negligible change. What do you suggest for her? Because this is a very important question. Many of the times we come across and during the challenge, the first phase of the challenge, also we came across the same thing. People are saying, uh, still my HbA1c, whenever doctor checks, it goes very high. But my fasting sugar is very good. Even the uh, BP is also very good. So they are confused. Yeah, as we said, the, the, the HbA1c, uh, if it is high, that means that this fasting, this is fasting and Two hours after sugar, this is done in a moment, right? But the HbA1c, this is the average. That means that he has some times where the blood sugar is coming high. And that's why we said that the continuous glucose monitoring is more accurate in detecting these attacks of hyperglycemia. So it is an average. We cannot say that it is controlled because of the fasting is good and the post -brangel. But if the HbA1c is high, that means there are many times where her sugar is coming up. Yeah, true. Uh, third question is from Mr. Vanessa Hi. As a general rule, what should we do to monitor our glucose? Just now you answered uh, the CGM is the best way to monitor. But your suggestion, ma'am? It's accordingly. I and mean, uh, if the patient is on insulin, yes, it is the continuous glucose monitoring. But if it's in oral tablet, usually we don't advise for the continuous glucose monitoring. It is a, still an expensive approach to the patients. So if it is, he, he can do the capillary blood uh, pressure, if uh, the capillary blood glucose by this machine, and not every day. He can do fasting or two hours, uh, once a week or twice a week. It is not mandatory for him to follow like this. Yeah, true. Uh, next question is uh, very much interesting because lifestyle is connected to this. So Madhurima is asking, is there a natural way to improve insulin sensitivity? Because generally we say uh, there is an insulin resistance and uh, that the reason glucose level goes up. So is there a natural way to increase the sensitivity? Yes, of course. Yeah. And, uh, that's why we are insisting on type 2 on the style life modification of the losing weight, of the exercising. Exercise increase the insulin sensitivity. Losing weight also improves. So we always... Uh, emphasize on the style life because it decreased the insulin resistance and the insulin which we have will work better. Yeah, true. 
ma'am, last question in the chat. Uh, I have more questions, but I will take the last first. Uh, Rakshit is asking, I suffered from diabetes after being COVID. And my blood glucose levels are very high. I was put on insulin uh, regime for three weeks. Thereafter, I am on oral medication. The glucose levels are not very high, but sometimes it goes out of control. Do I need to resume insulin? This depends on what he is taking, whether it will intensify by the oral or he will need insulin. It, it, we cannot answer like this. He has to be followed and see what is going on. And also to be sure what is why it is coming high. He is the, the way of food or the medicine is not enough or he is not compliant with the medications or yes, he needs, maybe he will need uh, some injections of insulin. So there are many factors which play the role. I will take one question, which is very interesting because uh, in the first phase uh, during the diabetic challenge, uh, second day of the challenge, uh, we had one participant from uh, Dubai and she was pre-diabetic. She has a strong family history of diabetes and she is overweight. Her BMI is around 33 uh, and she, to reduce weight, one doctor has uh, suggested to use Munjara. And she just did, she did, uh, the doctor did prescribe. She only mentioned about Monjaro and the patient uh, bought it over the counter to reduce weight. Now she is, she has reduced weight, but her uh, HbA1c has increased. When we checked here, the result came 6.9. Earlier she was pre-diabetic only. So what uh, should the patient do? Is it good to uh, go without for Manjaro just to reduce weight because she heard Manjaro has a good result to reduce weight and people are doing everything to reduce weight, you know, ma'am. But her HBC was how much before using the Manjaro? Uh, she didn't mention that. Obviously, she mentioned uh, it's pre, it was pre diamond and now she was 6.9. Yeah, but 6.9 now, but we didn't know the, how much it was. Maybe it was higher than that. And because the, because of that, the doctor prescribed for her the Monjaro. Because Monjaro is the medicine mainly also for diabetic. But if it is 6.9 and she lost weight, that means that her HbA1c was higher than that. The doctor didn't prescribe. The doctor only mentioned uh, there is a good medicine, Monjaro, which is very effective for uh, reducing the weight. And she's actually uh, fighting for reduction. And she up till now the FDA, yeah, but up till now the FDA approved it for the blood sugar. So if it is the blood, the HB1C comes six point nine, and she lost weight. Most probably, her HB1C was higher before. Maybe, maybe so we have to check uh, how much uh, she already mentioned it was pre diabetic, and she was not on medication for diabetes. So only she had a strong family. Because it is a medicine for controlling the sugar mainly, as the FD approved, not for the losing weight. It is not approved right. till now for losing weight. Right, right. So from my side, it's all finished. One last question, ma'am. Uh, as a general rule, what a person, what an individual, you will uh, give a message to all the participants in the uh, diabetic challenge. What they should be doing in regular basis, not only for the challenge, in regular practice, what should be they doing? This is this is the rule, the style life modification. They always should exercise uh, at least 150 minutes per week. They should think before eating what they are eating. It is the healthy food or not healthy food. This is the problem. When you eat, before you put the food in your mouth, think, is this healthy food or not healthy? They have to have some educational support from our dietitian to know what is healthy food and what is not healthy food. This is the main problem which I face. Many people think some foods, they are very healthy and it is not healthy food. For by controlling their diet and not diet, this is for life. I always tell them it is not a period and it will finish. This is, will be your life. 
So they said, I make a diet for six months and I gain weight again, or my sugar comes up again. This is the problem. It is not for six months. It's not for one year. This is your life. Life is very valuable. We have to take care about it. This is what I can say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, from one side, it's over. Uh, Professor, over to you. Uh, you know, Dr. Hala, you're summing up. Uh, uh, touched me very deeply uh, when you summed up and you said lifestyle management is the management of your life. Uh, I couldn't have heard it better said by anyone. I have been in this space of lifestyle medicine for the last 50 years, and it has been an uphill climb uh, getting my medical colleagues to accept the relevance of lifestyle medicine in uh, treatment. And I'm now deeply grateful for specialists like you, uh, Dr. Shweta, in last week's webinar, who uh, honestly believe that lifestyle change and lifestyle management is important and relevant in the management of disease. And of course, I'm grateful to RAC Hospital for allowing us the lifestyle department or the wellness department to exist. So thank you so much, Dr. Hala, for your you. affirmation uh, in you. the subject of diabetes and the relevance also of lifestyle, uh, besides the vast information that you provided uh, on the pharmacology aspect and the different medicines, the medications, the nuances, uh, the diagnostics, uh, it can only come with years of knowledge Thank you so much for this information, Dr. Hala. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would thank like you, to much. thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank our participants. There was a lovely screen that came up uh, when Dr. Wilco was asking questions that showed uh, uh, the participants. And uh, I, I'm, I'm certainly grateful to our participants for honoring us with their presence uh, uh, in these webinars. We we know that they are busy with so many things, but uh, we take a lot of trouble to put these webinars together. Uh, and not only do, the, do our participants uh, uh, delight us with their presence, I can delightfully tell you that many, many participants uh, look back on these webinars as a learning uh, experience uh, in later hours and later days. Dr. Wilco, I want to thank you very much, sir. Uh, you are uh, you are the cornerstone of this uh, webinar series, uh, and you take a lot of pains to put the questions together. Thank you so much for that. Uh, my colleagues in IT, this webinar went through without a single hitch, and I am so grateful. We started a few minutes late, but then it made up more than made up by the fact that it went through without a single hitch. And I'm grateful to my colleagues in IT for doing this. I want to thank Rank, Rank Hospital for all their support. And most of all, my dear, uh, uh, my dear colleagues in our wellness department who worked back end behind Dr. Wilku and behind me, your faces cannot be seen, but do know that we certainly appreciate your support and our faces could not be seen without your help. And ladies and gentlemen, next week, same time, same place, our Diabetes webinars. Thank you so much and good day.